Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with Rob and John. Hey, guys. Hello. This week, we are sharing a story that Rob picked called... Uh, The Babysitter by Robert Coover. It was published in the late 60s, I believe, and I'm pretty sure it's probably about... Uh, It takes place during, say, the 1950s into the early 1960s. And it's pretty unusual. Uh, um, It may even be unique in that I I don't think there's ever been... I've read a story that's been structured like this. It hops around from, I don't know, maybe six, seven points. Six points of view, maybe. And also, it's unclear if these things are really happening. <laughs> but it's still a, it's a really fun ride, and uh, I think you guys would enjoy it. So I'm just going to read the first. It's broken up into these little paragraphs that are separated by asterisk things. And each paragraph is really small. They're only about, I don't know, five or six sentences each max. Some of them are a little longer. But those kind of separate each point of view, and the story gets kind of tossed around. And uh, I'm just going to read the first couple to give you an idea of how it works. She arrives at 7.40, 10 minutes late, but the children, Jimmy and Bitsy, are still eating supper, and their parents are not ready to go yet. From other rooms come the sounds of a baby screaming, water running, a television musical, no words, probably a dance number, patterns of gliding figures come to mind. Mrs. Tucker sweeps into the kitchen, fussing with her hair, and snatches a baby bottle full of milk out of a pan of warm water, rushes out again. Harry, she calls, the babysitter's here already. Now we go to the next little paragraph. That's my desire. I'll be around. He smiles toothily, beckons faintly with his head, rubs his fast, balding pate. Bewitched, maybe? Or what's the reason? He pulls on his shorts, gives his hips a slap. The baby goes silent in mid-scream. Isn't this the one who used their tub last time? Who's sorry? Now that's it. And we'll do one more little paragraph. Jack is wandering around town, not knowing what to do. His girlfriend is babysitting at the Tucker's, and later, when she's got the kids in bed, maybe he'll drop over there. Sometimes he watches TV with her when she's babysitting. It's about the only chance he gets to make out a little since he doesn't own wheels. But they have to be careful, because most people don't like their sitters to have boyfriends over. Just kissing her makes her nervous. She won't close her eyes because she has to be watching the door all the time. Married people have it really good, he thinks. Okay. So that's the first three paragraphs. And the first paragraph, we're kind of in a third person for the most part. We go into Mrs. Tucker. The next one, we're with Mr. Tucker, who's the husband. They're going to a party, and he's getting ready. And then the third one, the last one I read, is Jack, the boyfriend, who's kind of wandering around uh, downtown with his buddy, who we don't meet yet. And he's trying to, or he's kind of, he wants to call his girlfriend to go hang out. So the reason I uh, chose this is because from there, mayhem ensues pretty quickly thereafter. And it's kind of unnerving how many points of view we go through and how quickly it becomes clear that we're not sure if this is a fantasy of each of these different characters. Uh, the fantasy, it's kind of, it's largely a story about sex and objectification, I would argue. The babysitter is sort of the object of desire for, for not only the husband that she's babysitting for, but also, of course, her boyfriend, her boyfriend's friend, even the little kid who she's helping watch, one of the little kids. Um, there's uh, several weird bathroom scenes that I don't have to get into that you guys can check out. <laughs> (laughs) (laughs) But it it kind of compounds from there where everyone's kind of looking at her, looking at her drooling, whereas the babysitter, her kind of her object of desire is the TV. And I think that's kind of where we get into kind of the... um, the nuts and bolts of this story. And kind of my general takeaway is, is that these people are largely archetypes. We're talking about a story that's kind of middle America. And it's kind of fascinating to think that the 50s was already, you say that and you have all these associations. And I think those were already built by the time this was written, only a few years after that time period had passed. And so you're seeing these kind of archetypes of the white picket fence and you're you're seeing them sort of flipped in that it's just, a, everyone's just kind of gaga over a teenager. And you're not sure if the cops, the cops show up at the end. You're not sure if someone has been been raped you're not sure if it's been in the mind of the little kid jimmy who's having a fantasy about his babysitter you're not sure if the husband does what he does with the babysitter and that's sort of the fun and you don't feel like you're being monkeyed with really because you kind of i felt like i was in on the joke because it presents itself pretty quickly Uh, i'm curious what you guys thought i'm a real slow reader so it took me a while to parse out the fact that this wasn't all this all couldn't have happened like there was a couple points where i was like oh is this past tense is this a different babysitter is this a different house and then once i kind of realized okay none of this can all happen these are all like possibilities then yeah like to your point you're kind of along for the ride and then there's obviously like moments of humor which are really weird because they're all juxtapositioned with all these nasty thoughts of rape which 
which are, oh, it's, it's really disgusting. Like that the author just really goes there. He talks about all of the bizarre fetishes from every guy. The fact that like his, this guy, the boyfriend is going to go in on a gang rape on his girlfriend because his friend just wants to. And the little boy who you think is maybe innocent or I don't know how old, four, five, six, seven, you can't tell by the end because what's running through his mind seems like something that he shouldn't be aware of. Like he's soaping up her back and drops the soap and she tells him to get it. And he's like, oh yeah. Like what? How old is this child? So I, I, once I realized this couldn't all happen, I guess I wasn't sure what the point of the story was, but I was, my takeaway was like, these are all the horrible things people contemplate and the things that do play out and don't play out. But isn't it still horrible that they think them? (laughs) It's almost as bad as had it happened, you know, Mm -hmm. because by the end, we don't know what happened, but we're certain everybody thought of these things. That's a great point. That was what I was like along for the ride for, because especially like you said, given the time period when this was based and when it was written, these are, you know, issues that however many years later, we still haven't fucking figured out, you know, like these dynamics that little boys learn and that teens go in on and that fathers play out in real life. These are almost tired in those approaches, but it's no less horrific. It hasn't been solved. Nobody even like talks about, I don't know, like the societal implications of any of these thoughts. Like there's, there's no external force that they're reckoning with. Like any guilt that the boyfriend feels is very much like, well, I hope she's not mad at me if I bring over a buddy here who wants to stick it in her. Like what? Holy cow. That's what I, when I was reading this, I was like, my takeaway would be to write about the things that are really uncomfortable because we've all had like bizarre thoughts like this. Like maybe we don't want to rape the babysitter, but you've toyed with the idea of killing the kid that's being really annoying. Or like, what if he died and this happened? I told everyone before we started that when I was looking this story up to print a copy, I, what I came across was not a copy to print, but tons of criticism about the piece. Like, And there are people, one woman, who reads this every year because it's just one of these classics somehow that messes with all of these points of view and there's just something so unique and creative about this that you don't see in any other piece of fiction. You can't even compare it, right? So she reads it over and over and over. I don't know. I guess my takeaway kind of was this is not something that you can replicate. This is unique. I wouldn't tell you to come up with six points of view and talk about what could possibly happen and and not give your reader a satisfying ending. But what I would say as a takeaway would be like, this goes there. It goes there and it goes beyond there. Some Reading some of this was just like, yuck. And you wouldn't want to read it with someone else or read it aloud to someone. But it's like, that was what made me, it was 17 pages. And I sat there in one sitting just like flipping through. That's a good short story, right? The definition of it. Indeedy. Yeah. And it wasn't just pornographic. It was like, there are implications that you could toy with. I'm still thinking about it. I read it like two days ago. I'm still think two days <laughs> anyway what do you think john like yeah, like both of you guys said it, it once you get into it you you start figuring out those um who's who and who's having which thoughts and so you know you get into that pretty quickly once the uh, stuff there was a couple the father harry he starts having a couple of i took them to be fantasies well yeah they were they were literal fantasies while he's at the party because he's like having these thoughts and like describing sc- scenes are being described and then people at the party are responding to his muttering like what'd you say <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then there was a couple, there was a moment where something was described and then I was like, wait, I can't fit that into the timeline. That yeah. that can't have happened. Where I was like, okay, now what do I do with that? And it happened a few, another time and then and then it started happening more and more as we approached the end. I was like, okay, my the way I read all that was um, like alternate timelines, you know, like, uh, yeah. you know, maybe because of the science fiction story, mm-hmm. but just potentialities, you know, like you guys talked about, these are just possibilities, things that didn't necessarily happen, but could have happened. Well, however we thought about it that like same experience you guys talked about is i um i was like then i was just along for the ride i was just uh stop trying to put it all together like yeah. a puzzle in my head and just let it wash over me but yeah same same reaction as you guys it, it's uh it's disturbing i mean i have two-year-old daughters and when she accidentally killed the baby i was like oh my god i mean i was terrified of that for the first yeah. six months of my kids lives and uh leaving her in the bathtub and and she drowned you know that kind of stuff just stopped me short <laughs> obviously you know, the rest of it was equally jarring, but um, I have a more personal connection to those oh, moments. Oh, yeah, for sure. It was interesting seeing characters who are kind of just defined by their fantasies and how yeah. when they when they pay so much, when I think the, the kind of the two things that I'm trying to marry in my head as far as I, what's the meaning of this story, I think we have characters defined by their fantasies, 
It's like, okay, well, why is that important? But even first off, how does that start? Or why would it start? Or what, why is Coover setting this with a babysitter in the 1950s, presumably? And I think television acts as sort of this, I don't know, if we're in, if we're in this house with these people and it's described once as a big house. So we're thinking the 50s, America's booming. These are successful people in middle America somewhere. And I just, television, from what I've read and from what I've heard and from watching TV was always on when it was new. And I think it was just this thing to have on. It was nice. It was new. It was cool. It was great. And you can sort of compare it to how kids are with a generation younger than us with just the internet and their mm-hmm. phones and they're always mm-hmm. on it. And this this babysitter is it seems addicted to the television because she's always trying to get back to the TV. She's always saying, oh, Jimmy, uh, I can still watch the news or I can still watch this or I can still watch that. Yeah. And I don't think there's great short stories generally. You don't turn a blind eye to anything. And I think that's huge for this character. And since this character is a since this story is about her, I think the TV is sort of like this radiating presence of just unreality in this house and in, for these people. And the TV, the television is gener- in general, it's a fantasy box. It just sort of radiates fantasies and you, you, can, you can plug into it or you can't or you can, you can turn it off. And there's this beautiful scene where the kids are running through the um, the living room and the television's on and their skin is like stained with the TV and it's purple and it's green. Oh, that's mm-hmm. great. And yeah. they, they, they look like aliens or they seem like they could be pixelated and you just get this idea that they, these kids are being turned into these TV archetypes, which I think was what the story produces here. So to see those things be played with and then to have the fantasy spliced up such a way, sort of like cinematically, like you can see a mad editor just kind of flowing up the celluloid like this. These are all the uh, note cards on the wall that he's trying to put in order. Right, it's absolutely. Yeah. That's like a schizophrenic wrote this. It was. It's, it's so invigorating seeing an artist just get a great idea and then just like go for it. So yeah, yeah, it's it's upsetting to read. Absolutely. So if that bothers you. <laughs> Don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that you're this far into the podcast. Yeah. Um, another thing that I noticed that he does like with these separate paragraphs and you'll have to like read it to really appreciate it, but there are a couple, especially at the beginning, I think eventually he kind of goes off the rails, but I'm looking at like page two where the end of a paragraph could easily bleed into the next one and, and it takes you a while to like get your bearings. So if you look at like the, for our purposes, the third full paragraph on the second page, the last sentence there is he glances over at his wife who readjusting her gar- a garter asks, what do you think of our babysitter? That's the end of that paragraph. And then the next paragraph, it says he loves her. She loves him. And then the babies come and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then when the, you read the rest of it and you realize we're talking about, we're in a different perspective at that point. Well, then that one ends and it says, what do you think of our babysitter? babysitter she asks while her husband stumbles all over himself trying to answer. She pulls a stocking tight, biting deeper with the garters. And then the, that paragraph ends and the next paragraph starts and it says, stop it. She laughs. And that can almost be in response to what you just read. Yeah. And I guess I, I didn't know what the, like the intended result of that kind of device was but for me it kind of reinforced this whole thing where you don't have a grip on the story yeah it's all bleeding into one another it's all somehow related and he's like intentionally being confusing mm-hmm. You're playing with pronouns like they're, they're, yeah she people don't me. have names they yeah. get pronouns exactly and so we have to like work mm-hmm. to figure out what's going on i yeah so i don't like working <laughs> uh, but this was the story that i was kind of willing like i was making like furious notes in the margins trying to make sense of it i figured it was at first some kind of riddle that i could solve and then the end would have a payoff and when it when i realized by the end that like the baby died and then didn't die i was like what have i done with the last 30 minutes and then like i said i went online and read all of this criticism and people are just kind of fascinated by what he did and the fact that he did it and there's maybe not a necessary conclusion or takeaway that we're all supposed to get but one person put it really well kind of to your point rob where it this seems like an author who got an idea in his head whatever that original idea was what maybe it was just the basic premise of a father preying on a babysitter but he decided to play out every possible way that this could have ended in his own linear narrative and instead just said like well this could happen and this could happen and this could happen and if and that was what he went into it with then maybe the takeaway is just very much like you know that terrible fantasy you have this is what could fucking happen even if it's not a pervy one or one that breaks the law it's just like these are the the primal or like dirty desires that you have and look what's going to happen and the baby's gonna choke. You're gonna slip in the bathroom yeah. and bang your head. It's almost sort of making fun of that too, I think. I think yeah. it has like this, which again, to the 50s, there was, I think there was just a general hysteria about fun in general. And <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think it was just like, for like what you're saying, like if you do any of this, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, this is happen. It's like reefer madness. If you get anywhere near this, you're gonna go nuts. It would be sort of funny to think of this as making fun of like a PSA or something. Oh yeah, for sure. And the part, the part that was like um, overt humor that really caught me off guard was this narrative with the wife where she 
that was so bizarre. She like goes to the bathroom or something and takes her um, yeah. girdle off and then she can't get it back on. Poor thing. And she's yeah, <laughs> the fifties. And then she's like struggling, struggling, and somehow winds up in like the middle of the party where everybody is so drunk that they're helping her stuff herself back in. And then at one point, and this is intentional, I think. Like he's, he writes it so confusingly. He says something about like she's being buttered up and the whole place smells like popcorn. And you're like, oh my god, this is literal. Like someone got a stick of butter out and they're buttering yeah, her up to shove her back her in her girdle. That was funny, but like juxtaposed. And somebody with, had like, butter on their hands later. Or yeah, yeah, like the husband or something. He's wiping it off. Or maybe maybe it was the wife like back in the home. But whatever it was, it's just like okay, I'm laughing at that, but I don't feel like I should be allowed to because meanwhile the babysitter is about to get gang raped by men of all ages. Yeah, I think what's it's interesting to hear these two things where you get you get in on the joke and you think it's cool. So I didn't have any of these reactions. So it's interesting to hear when you don't when you're not maybe it isn't a joke. Maybe I'm in my own sick world and I should have a gross reaction. I don't think there's any should, but it's interesting to see when when you buy it and it's like oh this is horrible and then when you don't bu- when you don't buy it or you feel like you're being winked at you're like this is great so oh it, sure you know it's really fun to see two readers and i think coover would be really pleased with that i mean wouldn't you yeah mm. yeah to the point that we were talking about before about like gauging your own pulse or like yeah. a reader's pulse this would be a great one to like give to someone and watch them read it aloud on video like, <laughs> you know like wait what oh yeah. my god like you know my mom would read this and just be horrified this, throughout those react videos on youtube yeah basically <laughs> Be- yeah exactly because this is one of those you know like all fiction all writing you have to read it on your own and you have your own like private experience but this is one of those ones that you immediately want everyone else to read so that you can talk about it it's like well, what would you think <laughs> what's yeah. the answer it was interesting that the the character jack who kind of prides himself as being the hero like that's his own little like hero fantasy fetish where it's just like oh i get to be the hero and he has these fantasies about beating up mark which which makes jack just as creepy to mark is i mean mark's oh, a cold yeah. mark sounds like a cold-blooded rapist no doubt but then for jack to sort of he's introducing him to the situation he's, oh yeah he's, jack sounds perfectly capable of making a decision as far as i should be hanging out with this person yeah. never mind letting her in front of my virginal girlfriend he even makes the comment that when he sees her cowering yeah that that turns him on and you know, yeah. he knows it shouldn't even right. though he just saved her yeah he's right he's no... he doesn't have to say that because we know mm-hmm. that you're bringing this guy and we know that we've we've seen your fantasy where you beat up mark in front of her yeah. it's just oh, that gave me the as far as what i felt like all the rape stuff was in the dead baby was like okay this is now we're in hyperdrive and we're just kind of flipping channels with these people because they're uh-huh. tv monsters <laughs> but before <laughs> but before that with right with jack it's like ew like you would oh, yeah. you would bring someone like that to yeah. your girlfriend well he, he even has a weird Weird, um, conundrum about it. He's just kind of like, I hope we don't get in trouble. I hope she's not mad. What? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh my god. But I think you kind of nailed it, Rob, when you talked about like p- th- this feels like flipping through the channels, right? Yeah. I, I, I picture someone because with the, the the little paragraphs, the little cool like staccato paragraphs, you get the idea of someone going kind of drowsily flipping the channels, and they're what a dead baby, what? And you kind of die jar awake, and you, I mean that's what I'm reaching, but oh no, I think that literally happens at the end because it's like I'll watch she, the late she movie. Misses, yeah, no, the, she misses um, parts of the plot, and she says I'll watch the late movie. No, right? the news. They're, they're watching the news, oh, yeah. and they catch something about a baby. Sitter. Right, 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 right. They're watching here. themselves. These are not, if I'm going to borrow the timeline way of understanding it, these are not the timelines in which the murders or the uh, right. or the accidents or the deaths or the rapes happened. These are just the, the ordinary timelines, but it's like, oh, something about a babysitter? What was that? Yeah. But they're not quite catching it, and um, it's as if the story itself is just flipping between them at that moment. Yeah. What, a, yeah. what a cool idea. It was cool, because they even do that with the actual plots on TV, like yeah, you said. The, like, the TV story has come to life. Yeah, into the, they, they articulate those you're like and then the bad guy's doing this and the bad guy's doing that and then they'll jump to the paragraph where mark and what is it jack yeah Yeah. are in fisticuffs and it's like wait what is this happening on the tv in real life yeah oh man maybe this is just like a tv a commentary on tv and like stop watching it yeah i think the 60s and 70s that was when you like the boob tube that expression is out (laughs) and like tv rots an alternate title boob tube tube. (laughs) yeah this is interesting too because um you know i remember when there was only three channels oh yeah or at least we only had three channels we didn't have there was one point in my life we only had one channel but uh, oh god nbc it was cbs i think (laughs) then i found some channels on uhf a few like a year later (laughs) so there's only like three channels and here how many channels of point of view do we have we have like yeah five or six a handful imagine imagine this now where we have thousands yeah
Well, I kind of already said what it is I would take away from this, and I think we've talked about it before, but the idea that if you have one of those thoughts that comes to you that doesn't seem appropriate somehow or makes Put you uncomfortable, yeah, yeah no explore <laughs> right. it. It's not autobiographical. It doesn't have to be. You can go there, and that's, <laughs> I think, what makes for a page turner is kind of like, oh, wow, someone was willing to, to write about this, and now I'm going to eat it up. I read this cool thing, speaking of Saunders, who we did a story of a couple of times ago. Uh, I was reading about, uh, who is also his mentor, mentor and teacher, Tobias Wolf, who we talked about with Bullet in the Brain here, he was talking about reading Saunders' story for his entry into the Syracuse writing program. And he was talking about how boring it was. It's the middle of the winter, not his story, but how boring it is to read, you know, hundreds and hundreds of applicant stories. And he calls them all well-behaved stories. And that oh, really, wow. really hit me in the forehead. I was like, yeah, don't let your story be predictable or be That's a great well-behaved. Point. And then if you read the story, it's Saunders. And you can imagine Saunders in his 20s. It's, it's pretty silly and bonkers. But yeah, I mean, talk about and not well-behaved story. Yeah, just going off, the, like, I mean, this is abhorrent, but I don't um, think that the writer, or author, or narrator, like, necessarily, like, agrees with it. We're just, like, exploring this together, right? That's what makes it okay to write about. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> What would you take away from it, John? My main takeaway is just the fact that we can read this and make sense of it just speaks to the capacity of our minds to make sense of things and to cohere a story out of noise, especially in a situation like this where that capacity is being toyed with. He's writing in such a way that he's like, I'm going to make my my readers work to make this make sense I'm gonna, yeah. or bring these things together. I'm not going to I'm not going to tell them who's speaking every time, they're, but they're going to figure it out. They're I put in enough enough information in here that you can figure it out. And um, I think that's a good lesson just for fiction in general is that you don't always have to tell us what's going on. You don't have to tell your reader what's going on. The reader is capable of making sense of it. Or want, like is willing to do the work too. Or like could be willing to do the work as long as you provide them something worth working yeah. for. Yeah. Was that already your takeaway, Rob? Or did you have a, a I mean, separate? Yeah, those, those, those the things you guys talked about are huge. You just keep the story. This, this story has no filler. It is all action. Something is happening every time. And it's usually, it's, it's usually engaging in the least. Or shocking, you know, or regularly shocking with what's going on in the story. So just try to keep the excitement meter as far as, far as the theme for these past couple podcasts is keep the keep the excitement high. And whether it's sort of like you can kind of I understand that not everyone who listens to this is a writer, but as a writer, if if you shouldn't, then you should try to realize what you're good at as far as what you can make exciting. If that's writing about like illicit sex, then you kind of owe it. You really, I believe this. You owe it to your reader to just write about that because that's what you're good at. And that's what you can make sing and make breathe and all that. So just try to do the thing that you can give the most propulsion to and really stick with it and try to figure out how you can expand on it and all that. Cool. Exciting stuff. All right. Thanks, guys.